Hi, I'm Stephanie Schottmeyer, a research scientist at the Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute and a member of the Florida Coral Rescue Team. Apologies for not being there in person, but I'm going to present some tips and guidelines for developing a collection and biosecurity plan for healthy corals in response to stony coral tissue loss disease using criteria developed by the Florida Coral Rescue Team and advisory teams and working groups from the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. As the overall goal of coral rescue is to collect and gene bank healthy corals, which will serve either as the parents of future generations of coral offspring that will be used for restoration or as the corals themselves, it's important to consider a variety of criteria when developing a collection and biosecurity plan. These criteria include species prioritization, genetic management, health assessment, transport, system biosecurity, and system preparation. The first step in developing the collection plan is to prioritize which coral species will be candidates for rescue. Prioritization might be based on susceptibility to the disease, the speed of disease progression across the colony, the prevalence of whole colony mortality, the contribution of the species to reef building, the current abundance and spatial distribution of each species within your region, the conservation status, or the species reproductive strategy. Other major considerations might also be the known amount of space available for holding or the possibility for expansion, the number of staff available to provide care for the corals, and funding. In Florida, we ranked each species into one of four categories. High priority target, where mostly species of highest concern and susceptibility fell into this category. High priority opportunistic, which were mostly species with high susceptibility, but those that were more rare on the reefs and may only be found in specific habitats and therefore may not be found at all collection sites visited. Medium priority or species with later susceptibility or disease progression, but are important components of reef building. And lower priority or species with late susceptibility and lower mortality. Our prioritization resulted in 16 high priority species and four medium priority species. 20 species in total. Only high and medium priority species were included for collection in Florida due to funding, space, and coral care limitations. Lower priority species remain more prevalent along the Florida Reef Tract, which allowed us for limited resources to be more focused on species with the greatest conservation needs. The second step in developing a collection plan is to consider the potential genetics and the genetic management of your collections. You want to make sure that sufficient genetic diversity will be collected to support restoration activities. The genetic target for restoration, based on guiding principles in common conservation literature, is 50 unique individuals or genets per species. Using this conservative estimate helps avoid inbreeding depression and limits the impact of genetic drift. Here in Florida, without the ability to conduct genetic analysis during collections and actually know how many genets were being collected in real time, we set goals to collect a minimum of 200 individuals per species in hopes that within the 200 colonies, we would have 50 unique genets. This became more difficult as the disease margin progressed, as we were trying to collect at least five to 10 miles ahead of the disease margin 
to reduce the risk that the corals had been exposed to stony coral tissue loss disease. To increase diversity, collecting a limited number of each species from each reef, for example, we only collected eight colonies of each species from each reef, will assist in maximizing genomic diversity by collecting from spatially and geographically different populations. In addition, this will maximize the diversity of brooding species as their dispersal distance is lower. You can also increase the odds of collecting genetically diverse corals or corals with potential adaptive qualities by collecting from different habitat types and depths within a species range. The Florida Genetic Management Plan includes the development of genetic markers for all 20 rescue coral species so that all rescue corals can be genotyped to ensure that 50 unique individuals were collected. To date, markers and genotyping have been completed for three species, Deploria labyrinthiformes, Pseudodeploria strigosa, and Meandrina meandrites. So far, we have met or exceeded our collection goal of 50 unique genets. The genetic markers for all 20 Florida rescue species will be made publicly available. Please see Alicia Vollmer's talk on Wednesday at 345 for more information. Finally, rescue projects and programs should utilize genetic catalogs or databases to house all of the genetic information collected during coral rescue activities and make it available to the broader restoration community. Step three is to determine how corals will be selected from the reef for inclusion within rescue holding. As these corals will serve as the brood stock for future generations and for the majority of corals that will repopulate the reefs in response to stony coral tissue loss disease, it's important that the brood stock is as healthy as possible upon collection. First, look at the size of the coral. Most species affected by SCTLD are reproductive at sizes greater than 10 centimeters in max diameter. So collecting corals between 10 and 30 centimeters max diameter will ensure that adult corals are being collected and that will hopefully produce offspring soon while not being too heavy for divers to carry or will take up too much valuable space in holding tanks on land. Second, look for colonies with live tissue edges that aren't buried in the sediment or have tissue competition with surrounding reef organisms. Third, avoid collecting corals with any type of active tissue loss, including abrasions and other irritations. Avoid corals with any type of Cleona sponge infestation or displaying signs of bleaching, paling, or discoloration. In addition, avoid colonies with multiple boring organisms such as polychaetes or bivalves, and do not collect corals with greater than 10% old mortality. In other words, look for the healthiest possible corals. Look to see how easy it will be to remove the colony from the substrate. If the tissue is damaged during collection, this may affect their overall health. As fragging creates more corals or clones, this does not necessarily increase their reproductive potential or genetic diversity. And some corals may have difficulty fusing back together. If any part of a colony does not meet the health criteria, no part of the colony should be collected, as some diseases are systemic and may just not be visible on the surface yet. Step four is to figure out how to best transport the corals between the collection site and the land-based facility to keep the corals healthy, in good condition, and stress-free. 
When transporting corals, ensure that the conditions are and remain to as close to the conditions that were present at the collection site. This will help prevent stress to the corals. Use clean insulated containers, which will help maintain temperature. In addition, keep the corals out of the sun, even if the containers have a lid, as this will also help maintain water temperature. If transporting corals in water, fill containers to the top to prevent the corals from sloshing around and prevent creating abrasions on the corals. We've even used bubble wrap to make little bumpers between colonies, but make sure to not damage fragile tissues by tightly wrapping the individual corals. Prevent crowding in containers unless the transport is very short, such as less than one hour. For branching species of whole colonies, less than 75% of the total volume of the container should be filled with corals. If fragments of branching species are used, less than 30% of the total volume of the container should be filled with coral. This is the same amount for massive species. If you're using really large transport containers, you may use some type of shelving to help distribute the corals throughout the water column. However, the shelving and coral should not fill more than 30% of the total volume of the container. Circulate and aerate the water with pumps and large air stones for any transport greater than one hour. Dissolved oxygen levels should be at four milligrams per liter or higher. Water pumps and air bubblers should not be directed directly at the colonies, as this may damage the tissues. Maintain water temperatures within one to two degrees Celsius of the collection temperatures, but never exceed 30 degrees Celsius. Also maintain salinity to the collection part per thousand. You should conduct water changes every two hours during transport, and each water change should replace 50% of the water volume of the container. You should use artificial seawater or water from the collection site, but never use water from marinas, intercoastal waterways, or untreated canals or wells. Do not transport for longer than eight hours at a time. If your transport is going to be longer than eight hours, arrangements should be made for overnight storage in a flow-through system. Upon arriving at your destination, all corals should be visually inspected for evidence of transport stress, such as bleaching or paling, any type of tissue loss, changes in tissue condition, such as swelling or thinning, or excessive mucus production. To further protect your corals, corals must not come in contact with pathogens or organisms that originate outside of your local region, nor water, equipment, food, or anything that might carry stony coral tissue loss disease or other pathogens. Therefore, strict biosecurity guidelines should be followed. Here are some of the guidelines to consider. Artificial or natural seawater should be used and natural seawater must be treated using ozone dosing or UV exposure. Rescue corals should be held in separate systems and even different rooms if possible from other systems holding corals, especially if those systems are holding non-endemics. For example, Tanks holding Florida corals should not be in the same room as tanks holding Pacific species, or corals exposed to SCTLD should not be held in the same room as pre-invasion Caribbean corals. 
If systems cannot be separated by rooms or a sufficient distance, splash guards should be placed around each tank to prevent splashing. Only use cultured live rock or biomedia acquired from the similar collection region as the corals. For example, all systems for Florida Coral Rescue used live rock collected from Florida or biomedia seeded with Florida live rock. Additionally, pre-invasion corals are only held with pre-invasion live rock and not rock that has been exposed to SCTLD. Do not use live bacteria starter products or live sand. All co-inhabitants should originate from local sources or from similar collection regions as the corals. And all live rock and co-inhabitants should be quarantined for at least 30 days. Frozen food or commercially processed dry food, such as pellets, flakes, or powders are acceptable, but live cultured food should be cultured in isolated systems to avoid cross-contamination, especially those holding non-endemics. If buying food from outside sources, adequately vet the vendor to make sure the food is locally sourced for your region. Conduct activities to avoid cross-contamination. Don't go back and forth between project tanks unless strict disinfection protocols are followed. These might include disinfecting your hands and arms with soap and 70% isopropyl alcohol and changing your gloves and soiled or wet clothing between systems. Projects involving rescue corals should have their own dedicated, clearly labeled equipment for use in project systems, including things such as scrub brushes, siphon hoses, and viewing boxes. These types of equipment should be cleaned using strict disinfected, disinfection protocols. Post signs to alert staff of additional biosecurity requirements related to SCTLD and limit project access to those trained in these biosecurity requirements. Visitors should be prevented from coming into contact with the project systems, including not touching the tank structures, the water, and especially the corals themselves. The final step in the process is to ensure that the system in which you're holding your rescue corals is properly sanitized and disinfected. Systems with any reuse components must be sanitized and disinfected. If the system is not 100% new, this includes all piping and life support system components, then it must be sanitized and disinfected. All surfaces should be free of biofilms. To remove residual organic material, the system should be manually scrubbed and rinsed with fresh water to remove algae, detritus, and calcified material. Remove any and all biomedia, live rock, and substrates from previously used systems. Only new biomedia and live rock should be used. Next, the system should be disinfected using a free chlorine solution concentration of 200 parts per million. This means that all parts and equipment should be soaked in or a free chlorine solution should be circulated through the entire life support system for a minimum of four hours. The chlorine should then be neutralized using sodium thiosulfate and rinsed with fresh water. Finally, the system should be disinfected with two rounds of peroxyacetic acid or PAA at 15 parts per million for six hours. If you have any questions or would like to discuss anything that I've presented here, please feel free to reach out through email. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the workshop and ReFutures conference.
Hi everyone, I'm, I'm really happy the previous talk had a lot of detail because this this one it won't have as many. Of course. Uh, I have to confess, I'm not a, a, a hero. Yeah, I, I have to confess, I'm not an aquarist. Uh, somehow, still, I got invited to talk to you about all you have to know uh, when setting up a land based coral nursery. Um, but what I can do is to give you a couple of examples of some coral nurseries I have helped to set up in the Caribbean. And as we all know, uh, coral nurseries um, became a really popular and recognized technique or resource for coral restoration and conservation. And we, we must think of a coral nursery as any facility or, or, or um, infrastructure in order to reproduce corals and to keep them most of life. Of course, that's the objective, right? So because of that also, we have to recognize that the animals we want to keep alive, they are quite simple, but at the same time, they have really complex, high complex physiologies. For instance, we know that this symbiosis they have with microalgae and through photosynthesis, it can provide up to the 90% of their metabolic requirements. That's from the book, of course, I have to memorize it. Uh, <laughs> but no worries, I, I won't talk further about uh, coral physiology, even though it's pretty cool and really like it. Uh, but it helps me to stress out the, the point that these animals, in order to be happy, they, they require specific uh, environmental conditions, conditions such as well, quality, like temperature. We all know the effects of temperature and bleaching, for instance, salinity and pH are other uh, really important uh, things. Nutrients, uh, a rise of nutrients in the water tanks, for instance, can provoke an overgrowing of algae. Light and water flow are, are one of the most important things. As we know, it has to be specific for the, each coral species we're working with. Uh, also, we know that corals have a natural vertical distribution in the, in the reef. So our task is to try to simulate these conditions, the water conditions uh, based on the flow, but also at light amount that these corals are used to be. Uh, so in general, we could divide these nurseries like indoor nurseries, which implies uh, culture tanks inside a room, for instance, semi-protected in case uh, there is some kind of shelter, but still it's not a room. For instance, you don't have doors. Uh, and totally outdoor uh, nurseries, which obviously means a cooling system under the sunlight. And of course, this can be like either open or closed system, depending if you are doing like continuous water flow exchange or just periodically. Um, so for already a couple of years, about 12, Coralion Lab in under the direction of Dr. Anastasia Vanashat is being has been a uh, work in developing uh, techniques and, and tools like affordable in order to reproduce corals and that way like save them. So today I'm gonna just talk about two of these examples and it's two well, a aquatic system that we uh, designed and set up in two locations of the Mesoamerican Marine Reef. So the general design, it's pretty simple and affordable and that was the idea. So everyone could actually access to it and start working with oral reproduction. And it has three main components. The, the first one is the reservoir. Do I have a, yes, this one but also it says reservoir, right? So that one, <laughs> so what is just pumping directly to that one? And from there it's repumped through a filtration system, a sterilization with UV and then delivered to culture tanks. And then by gravity is going back to the, to, the, to the reservoir again. So this is a closed system. It doesn't have any control temperature. It's pretty simple, but still it's been, has been used to reproduce successful corals. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a first example. This one was uh, established in Tornef Atoll in um, Kalosh Field Station. It was uh, the product of a collaboration between the UNAM Coral Lab and the University of Belize, and they called NOS pre Wildy System. Uh, as you know, as you can see, it's the same like basic design, while it just goes from the reservoir to the filtration system um, and delivers to the culture tanks and then going back. Again, this is a coral flow system, doesn't have temperature control and has artificial light, even though it works pretty well to reproduce corals. This is just a picture, so it can give you a better idea how about how these materials or, or tool looks like. That's a reservoir, and as you can see, it's buried on sand. It helps to drain all the water and also to keep or to maintain better range of temperature. That's the filtration system, and those the aquariums, aquariums uh, again. The idea was to design something that would be affordable and everyone could start working with these things. 
Uh, second example is the most recent lab I've been working with, and it's in the Valle Ibe and hold it by Fundemar. Uh, so as you can see, it's like a modified shipping container. So it might look like Breaking Bad from the outside, of course, but inside it's pretty different. So this one is located in Dominican Republic, in Valle Ibe, while it's pumped from 50 meters away from the from the where the, the shipping container is. And this is a drawing of the general, it looks pretty weird, but uh, yeah, I'm sorry. That's um, a drawing of the general like distribution of the elements inside the yeah inside the, the, the lab. These ones are just working tables. These should be like the according system, this is filtration system, all these are the nursing modules. And uh, for some reason there is no um Another like thing, the laser pointer. No, 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 that the drawing there is it's not there. Well, let's say anyway, if you want, you can you can you can check yeah, you can check the that reference and you can download all the all the uh, the signs. Um uh, that's that's the um, the pump we use to pump the water to the reservoir, which is actually that one. Uh the filtration system and this is how actually the filter tanks looks or the modules. This is the reservoir. And it's like a smaller version of the previous one. I mean, uh, we can pump the water here through a filter and then to the aquarium system and then again by, by gravity it comes back. Uh, in addition to this, we have like uh, temperature control and also monitor, like remote monitor control. Um, and finally, I want to present this, which might be a combination between like indoor Aquarium system and outdoor, and is held by Aquarium by, by Coralium Lab in Puerto Morelos. And these two persons, with Sandra from Sicor and the Magaña technician from Dunam, has been working really hard on keeping this like upgraded and in perfect conditions. And uh, this is a picture of the aquariums inside the lab, and are used in the first like mainly for sexual production until larval settlement, and then. The, the substrate are moved to the outside aquarium, which looks like this one. And this aquarium is also has been used to reproduce corals asexually via microfragmentation, for instance. And of course, since it's exposed, uh, shade has to be provided uh, to regulate, as I say, the amount of light, but also like transparent panels to avoid rain and water into the tanks. Um, Again, um, temperature is really important. So more volume of water requires bigger um, water temperature controls and bigger reservoirs. As you can see, reservoirs are also covered so it can protect them against um, heating. And finally, this is kind of a comparative table of between all these kind of aquariums and the price in US dollars, also the main uses uh, for each one of them. And even though it's mostly, or some aquariums can be mostly used for sexual reproduction with a little thing, with some tuning, it can be used also for fragmentation or to keep corals for a long time. But for that, we might, we might have some considerations such as define the objectives. I mean, it, which means what you wanna use the, 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 the aquarium system for or the nursery for, if it's gonna be for sexual reproduction, sexual reproduction, both, what kind of species you're gonna use and that will define the design of the aquarium system, of course. Uh, it's highly recommend to, to hire the expertise of, of people, of course, especially if you don't know about electricity like me. Um, where the nursery is gonna be, it's gonna define the type of pumps you need to move the water from the main source to, to the, your reservoirs, for instance. And the quality on the water, of, uh, distance of the water is going to be like more of the same kind of thing. Um, the staff requirements, especially we need or we want to keep corals like uh, alive for a long time, or we want to hold corals for a long time. Sorry, uh, you need constant uh, maintenance from the, for the corals and for the system, of course. Other type of equipment, we, we mostly don't think about a uh, like uh bumps spares and tools and other materials we need in order to keep this running and of course money is always an issue especially working with the current system it's not it's never cheap of course and it's always needed uh, to have troubleshooting and operating system 
Uh, finally, having a backup for electricity is, is really important, especially working with uh, outdoor aquariums, which uh, power shutdowns could cause increase of the temperature. And um, finally, uh, hello Ian, no? we all know that we are vulnerable with hurricanes, so having a backup plan for that or planning what to do in case of that is, is really, really important. Um, that's pretty much, I know it was quick. I know it's, it's not easy in 10 minutes to talk to you about everything, but thank you. <laughs> This is a very simple presentation, but the work to do this was not <laughs> simple and it's a, a very hard work. Uh, and it's um, managing reproductive corals in captivity. That is something um, that we need to improve when we was working with our main project. And the things with them, stony coral tissue disease is that in Mexico, we um, uh, uh, saw the, the first e events in 2018. And then we uh, get so many meetings and actions to do that, that um, action plan where too many things were uh, planned to do. But in the things that my institution, the National Fisheries Institute was involved, was in to establish a genetic bank of living tissue in captivity, because we have some facilities in, 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 the, in, in a pesca, and um, for those species susceptible to disease. And uh, the thing was uh, to make a collection of affected colonies and some ones that we suppose that resilient colonies because they don't have the disease. And uh, the things that we happened later was the uh, possibility to have sexual reproduction in captivity. Then the first thing we um, make the action was to found that uh, um, colonies that for to rescue and we launched this uh, warning to found the colonies um, because at, at that point, the, some species like Dendrogyra cylindrus was very rare and many of them was with a lot of disease. And uh, then we made a um, very, uh, coordinate uh, action co with collaboration with different uh, institutions. And this um, beautiful infograph um, represent the main steps. And the thing is in that, um, I can see here, <laughs> and when the uh, stony coral tissue disease was uh, aware in some place, uh, the things is to, rescue health colonies. One of them uh, without sign of, uh, of disease or in a big colony, take a, a little piece of the healthy uh, tissue for to rescue. And uh, also the, the other strategy was to um, collect the gametes. But the thing where the Inapesca was involved is in rescue fragments of colonies um, to uh, maintain in the aquariums and in, in the aquariums uh, have the possibility to uh, um, have the sexual reproduction. And these are the uh, aquariums that we have at Inapesca, and, and th there are separate for uh -huh. um, these big uh, aquariums are six meters diameter, 
and we call the mesocosmos. And here we put only the colonies that they don't uh, present any signs of uh, the disease in, in the field. Then we the thing that are the resilient colonies and they are healthy. And in, in, um, in a building, uh, inside the building, we have this kind of uh, aquariums that we call the quarantines. And here we put the fragments of the colonies with some uh, disease in, in, in the sea. And they had uh, uh, treatments with um, the antibiotic if they um, present the, um, the, the disease. And what happened? Oh, I'm sorry. And for this, the, the summary is that we uh, rescue 83 colonies from 14 species that in, in, the, in 17 sites uh, from 62 different genotypes. And this is some examples of the rescue species. And in three years, we protect 28 colonies of uh, reproductive size. Uh, when we were, were working with the, the fragments and the colonies that we rescue, we saw that 28 colonies have the uh, metric size and we take a look of them in the systems and 10 uh, of those colonies have a spawn in our systems. And uh, he here is uh, the um, nets that we put on them in, and these are the uh, species that we monitoring in, in those um, um, trials. And uh, that's one are the ones we uh, get some spawning. And this is a video in the um, Diploria labyrinthiformis that, uh, that it was the first one that we saw spawning in our aquariums and we were, were very, very happy with that. And also in the uh, quarantine um, aquariums, the Androgida cylindrus, uh, a male, um, a spawn in, in the aquarium. And we were very happy. If you could um, hear the, the sound of that video, it's a lot of, oh, wow. <laughs> Uh, th there is not the sound for <laughs> don't get trouble. And this is the many um, uh, institutions and collaborations, and some of them uh, in the um, uh, Pseudotorigoria, uh, Pseudodiplorestrigosa, and the uh, Dendrogera cylindros. Is, uh, we get some of the samples to um, the UNAM laboratory from the Dr. Anya Panasak, and they were cryopreservated. And th this is an excellent co collaboration with different um, institutions involved, and um, we are very happy with this project. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, good day everybody. My name is Logan Williams. I'm the conservation manager for Coral World Ocean and Reef Initiative Inc. or Cori, um, which is located at Coral World Ocean Park. And I'm going to apologize in advance. I should have added the VI CDAC logo on here, but I am also a part of the Virgin Islands Coral Disease Advisory Committee. Today we're going to talk about collection and ex situ treatment of SDTLD infected corals. 
Um, so just a brief, you know, overview of the presentation. I'm going to give you guys a really, really general introduction. Um, talk about some of the resources that would be needed. I feel a lot of this stuff has been mentioned already in the previous presentations, um, but this is basically the process that we went through to come to this point. Um, selecting target corals for ex-situ um, treatment, um, how we go about doing that, so the procedures and protocols for our rescue process in the territory, some lessons that we've learned, and then um, future actions and directions. All right, so very, very brief um, background. So um, the Coral Rescue Program wasn't initially um, included in the disease response plan for the territory, but it was something that we all really wanted to get involved with, but it really was lack of funding, you know, resources, personnel, infrastructure, everything like that. So at the time we were in the um, epidemic phase of the outbreak. And so we were seeing mass mortality on all these reefs and it was, it was devastating as you all know. Um, and so one of our intervention strategies, in-water intervention strategies at the time was to basically remove corals that were infected with disease to reduce that disease load. Um, so these corals were removed and then they were disposed of in a, you know, a safe manner. And unfortunately we were, like I said, we were disposing of them because we just didn't have the capacity to care for them or you know, attempt any type of ex situ treatment. Um, however, we did start moving in that direction and um, basically started experimenting with these ex situ treatment trials at the University of the Virgin Islands, which were successful to some, were, were successful. And so then we reached out um, or we basically um, referenced our amoxicillin water dosing methods on the Miller et al. 2020 paper, um, which you can see up there in the top right-hand corner, and started testing that at the University of the Virgin Islands. And also I was working at Coral World at the time. Now I work for the nonprofit, but we were basically, um, at least for us at Coral World, we were just kind of basically treating corals in buckets at that point. So it was extremely experimental, but you know, we did have success. And so we decided we wanted to continue to um, pursue this type of work. So um, this was kind of my personal goal, but um, in our VA, you know, um, sorry, Virgin Islands Coral Disease Response Plan, we do have some alternative goals as well, additional goals, I should say. And so basically it's to mitigate population declines and to preserve the biodiversity of SETLD affected species in the US, US Virgin Islands. And I would also like to clarify that this presentation is more geared towards their um, epidemic phase of the disease. We are now in the endemic phase. So um, some of these you know, methods have changed a little bit and we've also um, you know, received some resources to really expand this work and um, invest in some infrastructure. And our selected approach to coral rescue was to remove disease, small disease colonies and disease fragments from larger susceptible species from the field, bring them into a laboratory facility or ex situ um, nursery facility and then treat them. And then to basically retain those corals throughout the rehabilitation process and then basically pursue um, asexual and sexual propagation work for future res restoration activities. Okay, so the resources that you need, I would say this is probably the most important um, because I was kind of doing this on my, not on my own, but there's very few of us doing this work in the beginning. So personnel, personnel is very, very, very important. Um, you need to have an experienced field team, experienced divers who have been trained in this type, type of work. And ideally, um, big coral biologists or field ecologists who have a history working with um, coral health and disease. And then for your land-based team, um, you're gonna wanna have a coral health and disease scientist or researcher, um, aquarists that have experience in coral husbandry. And I would say that's probably the, for me at least, that would be the most important um, type of person you'd want on your team because I'm not an Aquarius. I don't have a background in coral husbandry work. Um, and so it, it's been a really interesting learning experience to go through this process. And then if you are able to obtain a veterinarian who works specifically with corals and understands them, that, that's ideal. However, 
a coral scientist with training in wildlife pathology or veterinary medicine and or epidemiology, I would say is, is you know, just as qualified um, for that position. Okay, and then of course, you need your life support system. So you're gonna have your treatment and isolation system. Like I said, this is all very rudimentary. You, anybody can basically do this and it's a very cost-effective way to treat corals. Like I said, we are in the process of um, constructing uh, a more, um, I guess, like uh, investing in a more advanced like water dosing system at my facility, but for you need treatment aquaria and containers basically to dose those corals with the antibiotics that you choose. And you need, you know, areas <laughs> in those tanks, or if you have small aquaria that are connected um, to an inflow outflow with the ability to have an open and closed system, that would be ideal. And then you have your general holding tank, and this all depends on whether you have a, your facilities indoors or outdoor, right? Um, so we personally have a land-based nursery facility that is located outdoors um, and we do have a flow through system. And so each individual tank is hooked up to its own UV sterilizer um, to prevent pathogens from being introduced. And you want to have large and medium sized aquaria as your permanent holding system to house those healthy corals or the rehabilitated corals, I should say. And then a quarantine system as well um, for flare-ups and um, basically for corals that have gone through the treatment isolation process and now they need to be moved into quarantine before they can put into that larger coral holding system. Okay, so in field work, um, you need a vessel if you're going to be collecting corals from offshore sites, but if you have a shore site that is your restoration site, you can drive there, dive in the water, collect your corals and transport them in coolers or buckets by a vehicle. Um, for collection, you're gonna wanna have hammers, chisels. We use resealable plastic bags that are one to two gallons volume to basically place our corals in um, throughout the transport process. And those bags are labeled. Um, I actually like to label the bags personally. I'll put, if I'm tagging a larger colony and I am you know, expecting to remove like, for example, a pillar from a dendrogyra cylindrics coral, um, I'll bring a cattle tag, put that in the bag, label the bag, and then um, you just have that, you know, chain of command, you know, which coral is which. But if you're out in the field and you have these bags and you aren't planning on labeling anything, um, you can always just take a piece of waterproof paper, cut it up, and then put it in each bag and then, you know, write down that um, unique colony ID, basically, when you collect that coral. And then... So that's like labeling supplies, cameras, and dive slates for documentation. I personally just use a camera. I photo document everything, but if you, you know, dive slate, of course, if you want to do that um, old school way. And then nylon mesh or catch bags to put your corals that are in your plastic bag in there for transport to the surface. And then you're going to need to have access to medication, critical care, and treatment. Um, so amoxicillin um, on the right, that's veterinary grade amoxicillin. The left, that's actually just fish amoxicillin that you can purchase online. Um, it is more granulated, so I would suggest grinding it up into a powder if you're going to go that, down that route. And then for topical treatments, we use amoxicillin, one to eight ratio of amoxicillin to base B. Um, base B is that um, the topical ointment that was um, created by Ocean Alchemist to treat corals in situ, but it works really well for spot treatments in um, land-based facilities as well. We also use various different cool coral dips and we're experimenting with some other stuff. So um, legal's iodine, that's basically your go-to if you're gonna be removing a diseased coral from the field, um, that's a great antiseptic. Uh, we also use frag recover. Um, I, I feel like it's a less intense, um, stressful coral dip. So if you're bringing in corals with active lesions and you're in the epidemic phase of this disease, I would just I would use legal iodine, but uh, frag recover is an alternative option. And then for ciliate infections, we've started testing this uh, non-alcoholic clove extract. Um, but like I said, you guys have been in this field for a long time. <laughs> Most of you are probably Aquarius, and you have your go-to, um, you know, antiseptic coral dips that you use. And so, this is just the type of stuff that we've been working with. 
And then obviously um, coral saws for amputations, uh, for smaller pieces, it's better. To, I personally think it's better to use, uh, you know, Griffin diamond blade bandsaw. Um, causes less stress to the coral, but if you're bringing in really large pieces um, then, and that are extremely dense and don't fit in the saw, then you're going to need like a tile saw or chop saw or some other method to remove that lesion. And then this is something that we kind of figured out. It was trial and error, I, I should say. Um, feeding corals is really, really, really important. And I guess I just didn't understand I didn't think about that in the time. We had a food system, so we didn't think we needed to treat, uh, feed them, but that has become a part of our basically like treatment protocol, like the corals get fed on a daily basis. All right, so now what, what are good candidates for this type of rescue? Uh, you basically, you wanna target highly susceptible or susceptible uh, vulnerable species, susceptible species, um, species that are vulnerable to further population declines or potentially um, becoming functionally extinct on your reefs. Um, and you want to, um, and if you see like the disease corals of opportunity, you would want to select those as well because they're, there's a potential they could be inadvertent, they could be spreading that dis infectious agent as they're kind of, if they roll around on the reef. And we were targeting basically corals that could fit inside the bag that you were able to seal shut. So 30 centimeters max diameter, but basically anything that can fit inside that one to two gallon bag. Um, and then at the time we were definitely targeting, you know, when we're removing parts of a larger diseased individual, um, yeah, you want to, you're going to target like that apparently healthy tissue that's on there. So that would be for fragments. And now I'm just going to go into the coral collection. Um, so these are our, these are the protocols that we follow out of um, Quarry. Um, so basically, when you get to your site, you find your target coral, right? You photograph that target coral. Um, you photograph that labeled bag or the paper that's in the bag um, with that unique coral ID. We, the way we label our corals is we'll put down the site code, the species code. Um, if you're tagging the coral, whatever cattle tag number that is, or um, just some random number, and then whether it's a colony, so that would be like an NA or if it's a fragment and then you give it a letter. So in that, it would be an A or B, et cetera. Um, so for colony removal, basically you're gonna take your hammer and your chisel, you're going to lightly tap underneath that coral until it pops off the substrate and then quickly place it in your bag, zip that bag shut, um, photograph it, and then place it in that um, catch bag, that nylon or mesh um, catch bag that you're going to be, that you're going to use to transport those corals back to the surface. And for removing, for specifically for dendrogyra, um, if you find a larger colony that clearly can't fit inside that bag and has, you know, multiple lesions. It's a pretty severe case of disease. If you're, if it's possible, try to remove only healthy tissue, healthy looking tissue, um, or apparently healthy tissue. And, you know, the furthest away from the disease margin or lesion interface is best, but at least two centimeters into that apparently healthy tissue. And when you're removing it with a hammer and chisel, you don't need to whack it off. You just kind of lightly tap it. Um, it takes a little bit of skill and practice, but you know we've been able to do that pretty successfully in the past. And then if you're removing living tissue from a larger colony, you want to photograph that colony after you remove that living tissue. All right, so you put your corals that are in your plastic bags in the mesh bag, transport them to the surface, um, you can use uh, lift bags to help with that ascension because sometimes the corals can become very heavy. And once you get to the surface, hopefully you have a team that's on the vessel already ready to go. They see your bubbles coming up and they're starting to add that fresh water into those containers. So we were using coolers originally, but I really like, uh, we've kind of completely transitioned to using um, large five or five gallon food safe buckets that you can screw that have screwable lids on them. Um, they're really easy to carry and 
they're easy to store. We just prefer them over the larger corollas. But obviously, if you're going out there and you're rescuing like 100 corals, you know, you're probably going to want to have some type of larger container to transport those. Um, so those coolers are filled up with fresh water immediately. Um, you're going to conduct a water change with your coral and then keep it in the same bag, um, reseal it. And for some smaller fragments, what we've noticed is if you don't fill the entire bag up with, with seawater, it creates some, a bubble basically at the top and it kind of floats around and protects the coral from banging into other corals or into the edges of the bucket, um, but also bubble wrap. Um, which was stated earlier in the session, um, can be used to protect these corals as well during transport. And then you cover, well, like I said, we've been using these resealable um, buckets. So we'll take the lid, screw it on, and then place it in the shade for transport. And then um, I didn't include this in here, but I have in previous presentations, anything more than an hour or two hours, you know, you're probably gonna wanna bring um, either portable bubblers, individual um, containers, so that the coral's not sitting in that bag for, for more than an hour, that's gonna cause a lot of stress. And then you're gonna transport those corals, for us, at least in the Virgin Islands, we're not traveling very offshore. It's really pretty quick transport to our land-based facility, which is located on the coast. So we don't do coral processing or amputations or anything like that on the vessel. We wait till we get back to shore to do that. So, um, but you know, it is, some you can completely do coral processing work and amputations um, on the vessel. Okay, so you transport your corals back to your land-based nursery facility, and ideally you would like to have your coral husbandry staff there ready to go with all the material that you need um, to start this basically amputation and treatment process. So you bring the coral in, you're gonna amputate it. Um, so you remove that you know, infectious material. And then we automatically transfer that coral into a Lugol's iodine solution. So 0.5 Lugol's iodine solution. Basically it's 40 drops of Lugol's iodine for every gallon of seawater. Um, and we let that sit for about 15 minutes. And we'll either use like turkey basers or pipettes um, and if you have small power heads, that's even better. And you're just, you know, trying to get rid of that extra, you know, exoskeletal material and um, mucus and all that, all that stuff that you want to remove from the coral. Once the coral is completed, it's dip. Actually, I should say at the same time, you should have staff there already collecting this data. Um, what is the unique ID of the coral? What process, like, did, did it undergo an amputation? Was it just coral processing where you're removing? just you know extra skeletal material um and then the size of the coral um the health of the coral when it was brought in health after processing or however you would like to collect your data um that would be a great time to do it and then you know you want to label your attachment pieces so your coral plugs or your tiles we don't use um coral plugs anymore and this is a very very small coral that we've removed so um we've been working with larger dendrogyra actually um, more recently but we we like to use these quarry tiles and they've been they look really nice and the corals have, you know, they they do really well on them. And so um that's what I'm gonna start using in the future. But at the time we were using homemade concrete um plugs that we had made. Um all right, so the coral's gone through its dip, you have this data, and you're gonna want to soak that coral or rinse it at least um in sterilized fresh seawater to remove that residue from the Lugol's iodine. And we do that for about three minutes before we transfer it over to, um, for its amoxicillin dosing regimen. And then of course you wanna photograph the coral before amputations and after amputations. Okay, so like I said, this was adapted from that Miller 2020 report um, where they were using ampicillin instead of amoxicillin, but we had, at the time, we had a lot of amoxicillin. We didn't have that much base to be, so we were being very conservative with our in-water treatments, and we were only targeting larger individual colonies. Um, so we were, like I said, we were seeing a lot, mass mortality in these smaller colonies of these highly susceptible and rare species. So that was why we started experimenting with this amoxicillin. And basically the dosing procedure goes, you're gonna add the amoxicillin to those treatment containers or um, aquaria. 
and it's going to be 100 milligrams of amoxicillin uh, for every sea ladder for every liter of seawater. And you want to make sure that coral's not cramped in that container, right? It's got, there's there's enough water, there's enough volume in there for um, the coral to, to not become stressed. And you're going to wait for that amoxicillin powder to dissolve into the water before you place your coral in there. And then the coral will remain in that treatment container for about 20, for 24 hours. It will receive, well, initially we were just doing 100% water changes because we weren't feeding them but we've started this we've changed i've changed this a little bit so they stay in there for 24 hours then they get 100 percent water change 50 percent of that water comes from um, a healthy holding tank with the same species in in the attempt to kind of try to replenish that you know beneficial bacteria that we know has been disrupted and lost or potentially disrupted and lost because of the amoxicillin treatment and then and then uh, we feed them and then we do another water change and then um, dose them again. And this, proceed, this process just um, continues for 10 consecutive days. After 10 consecutive days, you're gonna, well, you're assessing your corals this whole time, but especially on day 10, you're gonna take a really good look at all your corals. If the lesions have halted um, or the coral is completely healthy, it looks like it's healthy, then it's gonna progress to its isolation period. And basically what that is, it's gonna remain in its treatment aquaria um, no moxillin or anything like that, just fresh sterilized seawater in a closed system. Or if you're using buckets, you'd be doing water changes, right? Um, and ideally you wanna do that for about two weeks, um, but that varies depending on the protocols in your institution. And then once, once that coral has gone through that isolation phase, no disease has appeared, it's gonna proceed to its quarantine period, which is at least 30 days, but 30 to 60 days is more ideal. And then during quarantine, you're gonna wanna continue those health assessments because you wanna catch disease if it reappears. Um, but even if you know only one coral starts to get a reinfection and all the other ones look okay, they still have to undergo that quarantine process all over again. All right, so just really quickly, I'm gonna wrap this up. Um, the, I, I'd say the biggest thing that I've learned in this entire process is nutrition. Nutrition is so important amputations and nutrition, I feel like, I, I mean, we brought disease dendrogyra in. It wasn't during the epidemic. It was moving towards the endemic phase of the disease. The lesions weren't acute, they're more subacute, but amputation and feeding them and just making sure that, you know, you're keeping up with these really important basic coral husbandry requirements that are species specific. We've noticed that the, they did not get any new infection and they were completely fine. So I would say that just taking making sure that that environment is conducive to survival and health for this coral is the most important. Um, amoxicillin dosing is a great tool, I think, that you can have and use when you need to. And it can be used, um, you know, to help out with that disease response during the early phases of the epidemic. And if a coral does not respond well to the dosing, right, then it you should remove it. And you should just kind of try to take care of it with, like I said, feed it, make sure it's clean and uh, has adequate water flow and all that type of good stuff. Um, and then uh, just really, really quick, and I know I'm over time, um, basically our future actions for BICDAC is to develop and implement a plan for coral rescue. For a coral rescue program for species significantly impacted by CTLD, to develop and implement an SOP for infected coral rescue and treatment in land-based facilities and to evaluate the effectiveness of rescue and rehabilitation back to the reef for healthy and susceptible reef builders. And that's Thank it for me. So. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I will be running you on how we started our monitoring for coral spawning, um, our collection of gametes and our lar larval rearing. I will not take you to outplanting because we haven't outplanted, but Maria is here and Sergio from Punta Mar and they have plenty of experience on that. And, and we've learned a lot from them and they'll be at our table, so you can ask them. So I think it's really important after SETLD and Roatan is now in the endemic phase to uh, kind of determine what species you should focus on and why. And this will be dependent on your conservation goals. Maybe your country or government has some strategy um, or different priority criteria. 
And as I mentioned, what stages you're on and what species are available in your area is very important. Um, for example, we don't have many pillar corals available anymore, uh, mace corals, and so we're focusing mostly on sites where we've treated corals and we have corals that have responded well um, to SCTLD. And I won't go into much detail about coral biology and stuff, but I do want to mention that the majority of species that are affected by SETLD are what we call broadcast spawners. So they basically release their gametes into the water where they fertilize, uh, become embryos, and then go through the whole cycle where they become a planula and settle onto the reef. Um, and there's also brooders. An example of one that's affected by SETLD would be the lettuce corals or the agarisids, where they basically release um, a whole larvae that's already, that goes through the whole process and then settles onto the reef. Um, so other species that maybe you're familiar with but not affected by SETLD could be um, all the Acroporas that are broadcast spawners and Parides, which are brooders. And within the spawners, we have some corals that are hermaphrodites, which means that they release bundles of sperm and eggs into the reef, but we also have gonochoric. And unfortunately, a lot of our highly susceptible species are gonochoric, which means they are either male or female. This is mace coral, pillar corals, uh, flower corals. Um, and I guess to add to it, some of the pillar corals, one year might be male, the next year they might be female. Um, so that complicates things a little bit. And these uh, broadcast spawners, they have a synchronized spawning. This normally happens in the summer months between August and October. So you'll want to plan before the summer months to get ready to get in the water and monitor. Uh, some corals, especially in the Northern Caribbean, will spawn sooner than in the Southern. So something to keep in mind as you're preparing for this. And they do have cues from the moon cycle and water temperature um, to decide when to spawn. Spawning normally happens 30 to 120 minutes after sunset, but there are some species that spawn before sunset. So that's actually nice um, if you don't have much experience with night diving and things like that. So I guess the first step before you're getting ready um, and you wanna select your species, um, you have an idea which species you wanna monitor, you'll wanna create or maybe use a spawning calendar from somebody near you. There are some regional differences. Um, we in Roatan opted to uh, make our own prediction calendar and validate it. So we've been validating it for the last two years. Um, so you'll use both sunset times, day after the full moon, and uh, the literature available, right? If somebody's done it near you before, you can go and use, go by their calendar. And I would recommend that before you get in the water, um, you go and select, you know, the specific uh, species that you want to monitor and you plan accordingly because some might be very close and you only have limited bottom time. So choose wisely. We decided to start by the easiest one, which is a uh, group brain coral because they spawn before sunset. <laughs> and so that would give us enough time to get our team in the water and prepared for this. Um, they settle, they uh, settle quite well in the substrate, so we opted for that. Um, I know everybody talks about pillar corals, but that can be a bit complicated because we don't know, at least in Honduras, how many they are available, um, whether they're going to be female or male. Um, so that can be complicated, but Fundamar has had great um, experience getting them all the way to settle. Um, and for monitoring, you might want to go and, like I said, like I said, select a site where you know there are at least ten um, individuals of the species that you want to monitor, and you will want to tag and also map these corals because you know in the day your site might look a certain way, and then at night it might look completely different. So I recommend also diving that site in the morning and then at night if you're bringing new people or you're training people to monitor these corals. And because for at least for us in Roatan, we were validating our calendar. So we have a prediction window that for some corals could be quite wide. So I recommend monitoring the day before your prediction and the day after your prediction to make sure you don't miss that really amazing event. This is kind of our data sheets um, that we've learned from Fundamar. So I'm gonna get props to them. Um, so you want to just, you know, know if you can the time where the coral's setting and the time where it's spawning. That could be some data that you could collect. Um, and make sure to tell people to know, note what coral they're monitoring if they have a tag. And if you're lucky, this is a video I hope it plays. You'll get to see that. It's amazing seeing it in the water. Uh, that's a group brain coral. 
So how do we collect the gametes? So you've validated your calendar, you kind of narrowed that prediction window. The most common way to collect gametes is through a conical net that you see right there. Um, it's very simple, it's got a funnel, but you'd be surprised that many Caribbean countries don't have funnels available. Um, so for us in Roatan, it's hard to get funnels. <laughs> it has a little buoy and it ha can either have a let it rope on the bottom or a rope depending if it's a branching coral or not. And um, at the top, you can have kind of a falcon tube or a little jar. You can get creative. Each net in each country can be completely different. And we've learned these really sophisticated method from Pundamar to collect with a Ziploc bag for pillar corals. Um, so, you know, you can give each person a Ziploc bag and when they see it spawn, they can kind of do like a scooping motion and try to get uh, some of those gametes. So once you've collected it, some people might find this lab familiar. Uh, this is in Dominican Republic. Um, you'll combine those gametes in seawater. You will have to filter the seawater before. If you have a fancy lab like from Damar, you can do that. If you're in Roatan, you'll have to manually um, filter that water with a mesh or something. And um, then the next step will be sampling and waiting for fertilization to appear. So here you can see kind of the cleavage and they're really adorable. And this is kind of their quantship phase, which I think is super cool. So once you've fertilized them, you've done the assisted uh, fertilization, we are using uh, cribs, which are coral rearing in situ basins. And in the water, this is in situ larval rearing. Unfortunately, permitting in Roatan is a bit complicated for ex situ nurseries or collections. So we're mostly in the water. And setting the crib looks pretty easy there, but it's a bit more complicated. It has a PVC structure. Um, inside you have crates where you'll put your substrates and then you can inflate it with a tank or something like that. Here are substrates. These are the C-Core substra substrates. These are the ones we've used in Roatan, but Fundamar and Dominican Republic has made their own molds and they can get you know, uh, people involved, volunteers or interns to make these molds for them. Um, so they, don't, they can reduce their cost of creating substrates. These need to be conditioned a couple of months before you're getting ready to collect them so that they can grow Cousteau's curling algae on them and your little babies will be more likely to settle. This is what it looks like. I'm gonna get a bit, I think I'm a bit, how am I in time? You're good, perfect. <laughs> um, this is what it looks in the water. It has little windows there to let water in and out, but to keep um, the plant, the larvae in there. So that's pretty cool design. This was designed by Secor using materials of like rafting, um, boat thingies. And you'll want to clean that crib. Less is better. For us in Roatan, we can clean it once a week. We've chosen an area that has pretty good water quality. We've also chosen an area that's far enough from tourists, but close enough for us to swim so we can reduce costs of getting there by boat. We can just snorkel there and clean it. And you'll want to collect some of your substrates to kind of monitor um, how these larvae are settling on your substrates. And if you're lucky, Maria, I have it for you. <laughs> this is a little baby pillar coral from Pundamar's um, in situ nursery, I guess. Um, and they are adorable. So this is a lot of work. <laughs> it requires a lot of manpower. It requires a lot of days in the water, a lot of night diving. And I don't think that the Roa Time Marine Park could do it alone. So we've partnered with a lot of local dive shops, which have provided every month that we're monitoring boat, captain, fuel, and even some of their staff. So Without them, this work would not be possible. Something else that we've done is getting just the citizen science people involved. We do circulate on our social media the prediction window, and we encourage dive operators to get their guests in the water around these times, although some are quite late, so it could be a bit complicated for them. But they might be able to monitor some species that you don't have time so that you can validate more species at the same time. And I always like to end on a good note. Um, and we have, through this collaboration with Dive Shops, which started during we, when we were treating stony coral tissue loss disease, we had Dive Shops adopt dive sites through, through an adopted dive site program. And now we've transitioned these dive operators to collaborate with us in our spawning work. So uh, one of the collaborators got very invested on three pillar corals that are still alive since 2020 in the water. 
And those were initially Peter, Pam, and Petra, but they changed sex. So now <laughs> they're just one, two, three. <laughs> so anyways, we've seen them spawn for the last two years. And I, but um, what I wanted to share was basically, you know, that um, we have invested in these squirrels. They're still spawning. And just like Claudia was saying, you hear kind of like an underwater scream of like, ah, when it's spawning. <laughs> So anyways, thank you so much for your time. I'll be around if you have any questions. I'll be on the table with Maria too, if you have any questions as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Stacy Williams and sorry I cannot be with you today to present this um, presentation. But today I'm going to be talking about why, the importance of restocking sea urchins and improving coral reef restoration. The picture that you see on the screen is a common sight here in Puerto Rico uh, on shallow water reefs and it might be the case uh, in your country. Uh, where we're seeing a decrease in coral cover and an increase in fleshy macroalgae cover, like increase in dictyota, also um, uh, in labophora. So in here in Puerto Rico, what we've been seeing also is an increased abundance of uh, encrusting pacinelli called Rami Crusta. On the east coast of Puerto Rico, I've measured Rami Crusta cover to be as high as 60%. So this is the dominant substrate on most east coast reefs. And we're seeing uh, this pacinella also increase in abundance all, all, all over Puerto Rico. Uh, the Rami Crusta uh, is quick grower and uh, can't overgrow and smother live coral tissue as you see in the right hand photos um, on this Arbacella annularis colony. Given that many Caribbean coral reefs have a high abundance of benthic algae like fleshy macroalgae, or in your region you might have a high abundance of Rami Crusta, it is not ideal to go out and outplant corals on these reefs because most likely the corals are not going to be able to survive or compete against this algae. So what reef restoration practitioners usually do is they manually uh, clean this substrate um, and maintain the substrate clean um, so that these coral outplants can survive. This requires, um, possibly requires a lot of people in the water and a lot of boat time and can be very costly. So why don't we take advantage of herbivores and let herbivores do the job? So we can enhance herbivory by restocking herbivores and the main herbivores that we have on Caribbean reefs are sea urchins like diadema, um, tripnustes and Econometra veritas. We have herbivorous fish like the parafish and surgeon fish and we also have herbivorous crabs. So in my presentation today, I'm going to be focusing on sea urchins and restocking sea urchins, but these techniques can be used for other herbivores. So there are three ways to restock herbivores. You can re redistribute healthy populations. So you can take a couple individuals from a healthy population and move them to another reef. We, we will be doing this here in Puerto Rico with Econometra viridis um, and moving them to deeper reefs to see if they eat labophora. Another way of producing individuals um, for restocking is by larval rearing them in the lab. Uh, Josh Patterson in Florida and Alwyn and Seba are doing this uh, with Diadema antelarum. I'm currently doing this with Tripnustes ventricosus here in Puerto Rico. Um, this, that's the West Indian sea egg, as you can see in the picture, um, in the middle picture. Another way to produce individuals um, to restock to reefs is to collect uh, the post-larval settlers. And I'm currently doing this um, with diadema and I will go more into detail on how we do this and some of the results that we've had um, when we do restock uh, these sea urchins to the different reefs. So I'm not gonna go into details on how we collect settlers, diadema settlers here in Puerto Rico. Um, if you want, please contact me and I can guide you on how to set up um, uh, mooring lines or sediment plates in your region. 
Uh, what we do here in Puerto Rico is that we, during the summer months, because that's when there is a peak in settlement of diadema, uh, we set out mooring lines with sediment plates. And these sediment plates, which are just made of um, astroturf, these plastic mats, um, doormats, um, these plates are set out for a month at a time. And uh, we, when we collect them, we bring these plates back into lab and we individually pick off the urchins off these plates. This is uh, on the bottom right hand side of uh, the screen. You can see um, the small little sea urchin. This is a diadema settler. Settlers can range from 0.4 millimeter in size to a millimeter in test diameter. Um, usually they are red um, and they have banded spines. So these urchins are placed in tanks at the Department of Marine Science at the University of Puerto Rico. And they're in these tanks for about almost a year um, until they reach a young adult size, which is between two to four centimeters in size. And then, then that, that's when they're ready to then be transferred to the different coral reefs. Here are some results from the last restocking event. Uh, late last year and early this year. This site is in the east of Puerto Rico called Cayo Largo in Fajardo. Um, as you see in the picture, the top left picture, um, before restocking diadema, the reef was characterized by a high abundance of dictyota. Um, after two weeks, diadema removed all the dictyota and what was left was Rami Crusta. This is very common um, here in Puerto Rico where we have seen fleshy macroalgae growing on top of Rami Crusta. Um, by two, one month, uh, diadema have removed most of the Rami Crusta. Um, and by two months, you can see the substrate is really clean. So what we've seen in a two month span is that diadema can significantly reduce the cover of Remy crusta, um, also of fleshy macroalgae like dictyota, and also those thick turf mats that collect sediment. So given these positive results um, of restocking diadema, what we've been doing here in Puerto Rico is that we restock diadema in areas where we're out planting corals. So in the next couple of slides, I will show you some of the preliminary results that we have record recorded so far. Here in Puerto Rico, my organization, ESER, along with the Department of Marine Science at the University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez, and the Nuevo Restoration Center, developed the first land-based coral nursery um, in La Perguera. We currently have 14 raceways. Uh, we, my organization also received funding um, from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to develop an, a second land-based coral nursery in Ceiba. Um, we will have 12 tanks. Um, this is in collaboration with the Department of Environmental and Natural Resources and also Sociedad Ambiente uh, Marino, SAM, uh, a nonprofit organization located in Rio Piedras and San Juan. In our coral nurseries, we've been focusing, focusing on microfragging eight coral species. These include the three species of orbicelids, also dendrodryer cylindris, um, corals that have been affected by stony coral tissue loss disease like Matistria cavernosa, uh, Pseudodiplorus dragosas. Um, we've been actively, well, before Fiona, we've been, we were actively rescuing some of um, the corals like uh, the Montestria cavernosas and Pseudodiplorias dragosas um, that were not affected by the disease and bringing them back in lab um, and microfragging them and keeping them in tanks. Um, so these are the corals that we've been using um, and outplanting to the, the different coral reefs, um, mainly in La Perguera and also on the East Coast in Fajardo with our partners, um, Sea Ventures. Late last year, we did an experiment. This is part of a uh, master's student's thesis, Noel Carrera. He was supposed to present at the meeting but ended up canceling his trip because of uh, the storm. Um, but what we did was that uh, we focused on four patch reefs um, at Margarita. This is in La Praguera in the southwest part of Puerto Rico. So two patch reefs, the control patch reefs, uh, we outplanted just corals. And then the two other patch reefs, we outplanted corals and we restocked diadema. And those were called the experimental um, patch reefs. 
So these photos are from a couple months after outplanting the corals. Uh, this is at the control reef. So this is the, the reef that does not have any diadema. As you can see, uh, the Pseudodiploria strigosa um, frags outplanted are, are competing, are getting kind of covered in cyanobacteria and um, by fleshy macroalgae like dictyota in the upper left hand picture of the screen. Now at the experimental patch reef where we outplanted corals and diadema, you can see a stark difference um, in, the, in the cover of algae. Um, this is the same genotype as the coral that I showed in the, the previous slide. So you can see that the corals, uh, the, the surrounding of the coral is, is really clean. Um, you can see uh, qu quite a bit of CCA and these corals are uh, not competing against cyanobacteria and uh, fleshy macroalgae. As you see um, from the pictures on the screen, the picture to the left, uh, corals outplanted without diadema. Uh, the picture to the right is corals outplanted with diadema. And what a difference it is. Um, the corals to the right, again, are not competing against, um, are competing with uh, algae, and most likely will have a higher survivorship um, than the corals to the left, where are being smothered by fleshy macroalgae and also cyanobacteria. Also in 2019, uh, we did a small little experiment where we outplanted a cropper palmata uh, cuttings to one of the reefs where we restocked diadema. So we placed uh, the cuttings uh, in areas where there are no diadema and then areas where we restock the diadema. And these photos are a year after outplanting these cuttings and you can see that uh, the, the cuttings of palmata that were um, cemented um, in areas without diadema, you can see that the dictyota is slowly encroaching and covering the palmata where to the right, um, the, the palmatas that were cemented in areas where we restocked diadema, you can see that the substrate's really clean um, or surrounding the live tissue. So most likely, again, the coral to the right is going to have a higher survivorship than the coral to the left, just due to the competition um, with uh, fleshy macroalgae. So in conclusion, diadema are effective in removing fleshy macroalgae. Also, they're really thick turf mats with sediment and rhamnocrusta. Uh, their grazing effects can be seen one week, two weeks, one month, two months after restocking them to the reef. We believe that diadema will increase the survivorship of coral outplants um, because what we've been seeing is that uh, diadema uh, will remove fleshy macroalgae and cyanobacteria that many times will compete against um, uh, these coral outplants. Um, now, given that there is a mortality of diadema um, in the region and um, uh, there should be some consideration when restocking uh, diadema to the different habitats. Like for example, you don't want to uh, restock diadema to a reef that has a high abundance of triggerfish because um, they will that a triggerfish is their main predator. Um, you can use other species of sea urchins uh, to restock to uh, decrease um, benthic algae. Um, for example, like Echinometra viridis, the rock urchin, um, they're smaller, so you will need more of them, but they are, are as effective at removing um, benthic algae. Also, um, I was supposed to present uh, some results of our, of we restocked um, the West Indian sea egg, Tripnusti ventricosus. Um, what we found is that they will also uh, eat fleshy macroalgae. Um, they just take a little bit longer time than uh, diadema antelarum. So you can use different approaches, um, as specifically different species of sea urchins, uh, to, to maintain and reduce um, benthic algae on your coral reefs. 
Again, sorry I can't be there in person, um, but please feel free to contact me. Um, uh, here's my email, um, our organization's website. Um, this project is in collaboration with NOAA, um, the Department of Natural Resource and the Environment here in Puerto Rico, and also Sea Ventures. So thank you for listening. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Dana. Uh, my name is Alisa. I'm from the Turks and Caicos Islands and uh, part of a very small nonprofit NGO with uh, very little finance in our history. And so it's been quite a journey to get to where we are and uh, some of the different projects that we've been able to do. Um, and turns out I found out I'm relatively good at, at finding creative ways to, to get people to give us a little bit of money and to get involved and to connect people with our projects. Um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about it today. I'm going to try and focus on a couple examples. Um, just as a background, we've got about 13 years of environmental advocacy and the only um, NGO in the islands focused on the environment. Um, and until a year and a half ago, we were volunteer only. I was given a position uh, in February, 2021. And so it's been quite a journey on the way. But we first got SCTLD in 2019. Um, at that point, I didn't know anything about coral diseases. Um, thankfully in 2018, uh, through AGRA, we learned about benthic stuff. And the first step was, okay, well, how do we get out there? The Turks and Caicos is quite a large expansive area and it's expensive, but the reefs are not accessible from the beach. So how do we finance the monitoring and getting there? So that was the first part was figuring out monitoring and treatment. So we started with outreach. Sorry. So we started with outreach and the idea there was just engaging as many people as possible, just going to all the dive shops. Uh, one of the dive shops in particular said, Alize, you've got a spot on the boat. So me and one other person that we trained were able to go out for free. And originally, without that, we wouldn't have had any monitoring data on the spread of the disease. Um, so that was a huge part of that um, initial effort. And then engaging hotels and different corporate businesses on the island and trying to get them, find out what their passion is, what they're interested in and then relate it back to the coral reefs, because as for many of you, I'm sure, the reefs are the source of absolutely everything in the Turks and Caicos. So whatever you care about, it's gonna be connected to the reef. If you care about money, you care about the reef. If you care about food and sustenance, you care about the reef, coastal protection, big hotels, everything comes back. I mean, for us, literally the ground we stand on is ancient coral reef systems. Um, so it's connecting people back to that and in the first four months, we were able to raise about 50 grand. Um, and that was just to pay for fuel, get the boat out, get some initial treatment um, in and um, get involved that way. So I also, before moving on, started partnering with Ocean Alchemist. So we agreed to test some of their products. And in exchange, we were given quite a lot of the base 2B. So just being open to partnerships, to working back and forth really allowed us to get access to certain things that we may not have been able to before. But actually one of my, um, Dana asked me to kind of think about some of the more successful projects we've had. Um, and uh, the partnership that we've created with Mount Gay uh, Rum, even though Turks and Caicos and Barbados are pretty far apart from each other, um, has been really, really great. So <clears throat> we, uh, last year during World Ocean Month, um, the wine seller, the local distributors contacted us and said, you know, we're trying to do um, some environmental activism and we'll give you $2 for every drink purchased in certain places. And that led to rum powered research, which has been one of my most successful plans. So over the last years, we've created a few different itineraries. I come from a dive instructor background and I've worked on the liveaboards, So that gave me an in there, but connecting with, um, organizations or liveaboards like this was a wonderful way to get out there in exchange for a few talks in the evenings. You can get guests who are coming specifically to dive with the experts. 
Um, still trying to think of a better phrase than meaningful tourism, something a little more uh, pizzazz, but I haven't got there yet. Um, but rum powered research ended up raising over $28,000 that allowed us to go out for a full week and do um, data collection, surveys, and treatment on East Caicos, which is actually uh, the largest uninhabited island in the region um, and with very anthropogenically unaffected reefs. So we had been there in 2018. So one of the only places, uh, I just need to find the time to go through all the data that we have that comparison of pre and post SCTLD. Um, so run powered research, we use that to leverage other companies. So I contacted lots of other um, rum <laughs> companies and uh, leverage them to kind of get involved. And that's something that we've trademarked and that we're gonna be using year and year. Um, and it's something that can grow and can go from something really small to something really big, um, just through kind of grabbing the attention. On a small island in a lot of the places we live, tourists come and they love to drink rum, right? So they come, they drink their daiquiris, they drink their rum punch. And if you can somehow get that to help finance your work, that's that would be really helpful. And then the second thing is from the onset, I've always said we need to get some of these corals out of the water. They were just disappearing so quickly. And I promised myself within two years that we would have some kind of gene banking. Uh, it took two years, three months and two days but island time. <laughs> um, and we finally got there. We wrote so many grants and none of them came through. We're a tiny nonprofit. We could only be eligible for a small percentage of what our annual fundraising capacity is, which is less than 100,000. So if you're getting 30% of that, you're not gonna get very far. And then we decided to change the tactic a little. And I think this for me has been the game changer is we wrote it a grant as a feasibility study. So we changed the language. Instead of saying, give me money to build a coral research center, said, give me money to build a pilot system and learn how to take care of coral. And I just happened to decide that while we're learning, we're also going to gene bank because, well, time is critical right now. So it's kind of a necessity. But we were successful. So this year in 2022, we got a grant from the John Ellerman Foundation. Um, and we got that through the creation of this feasibility study project. And so for any small organizations that are trying to get um, grants, I thought that this was our most successful way. Um, it did, of course, mean that we had to partner with somebody who actually knows how to take care of corals and what's happening. And so we partnered with the Reef Institute, um, who have been absolutely amazing. And uh, in our grant, they were the scientific council. And I think that was the, the censure. Uh, so not only calling it a pilot study or a feasibility study, um, but also having a really strong partnership involved in that, that kind of gives the foundation confidence in your project. Um, so that was a really big part of it for us. I've got to admit so far, um, it was $150,000 grant for two years. Um, and that involves part of it for uh, human resources, part of it for scientific console, part of it for actual physical structures and equipment. At the moment, we have the full system built and we've only spent about 50 grand. Um, and we're, we're doing stuff that's quite incredible that I thought would have cost a lot more. Now, 50 grand is not nothing, no doubt, um, but it's more accessible than 150 or 200 or $300,000. And uh, we currently have 400 corals that are in situ that we rescued off a pier that was being destroyed. Um, and about a hundred of them are currently in the system, but we have to scale them in uh, in stages so that we don't overwhelm the system. But I think my two big things have been kind of somehow, I mean, it's a tourist destination. People love to drink. <laughs> don't know what else to tell you. So I made cocktails in conservation. It just kept going with that. Now Tito's gave me a thousand dollars last month, but that's, pretty awesome for me. Turks Head Brewery sponsors a lot of our projects. Um, and so just finding ways to find what those different companies are interested in and then leveraging that back um, to, to fundraising. Uh, corporate sponsorship has been, been a big part. Admittedly, without South Bank, for example, we would not have a facility. So that part was donated. Um, finding a development or a resort or something that 
I mean, developers are the enemy, if we're completely honest. So they need to make a, some effort. And uh, often this is the kind of thing where you can get somebody to want to be a part of it because then they get their logo on environmental um, work. Um, and this was just a last little thing uh, because that those corals that were being put at the dump, it took us two days, we only had two days to, to rescue them all. Um, but yeah, essentially uh, the getting creative, finding little ways to engage different people, businesses on the islands, and then basically just keep on begging and talking in passion. I mean, the fact that 30 people in three boats showed up to help me was incredible. And we, it, it happened and we did it really quickly. Um, I have a lot of captains who will donate some time as well. But I think my biggest takeaway is just get creative. Nothing is too small. Like I thought I was gonna make three or four grand off the rum project. And we ended up being able to finance a full week of research and that was quite incredible. Um, so get creative and then just always, I keep saying, uh, we've said this a lot today. I mean, action really is the antidote to despair. Like you feel like you're doing something, you need to do something. Well, if you want action, then you need some compassion and you can get people to, to be inspired that way. And that's it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, special hello to all my MPA Connect friends. I miss you all. Um, hi to all the new friends and experts who are joining us today. And thank you all for, for being with us. Let me, um, let me share my screen. Um, Alizé has said so much good stuff, and it is a huge pleasure to be able to follow on from her. Um, what, um, what I'm going to do is I want to tell you a little bit about the lessons that MPA Connect has learned on tools and mechanisms for sustainable financing of coral rescue. We know that financing is the critical topic for everybody. The MPA managers that I work with constantly tell us that the number one priority need is sustainable financing, which means that it's reliable, long-term, and it's unrestricted. That's like the holy grail for managers. And it's something that all too few of us have actually achieved. So when we sent out a pre-survey to some of the managers in the workshop today, it actually came as no surprise to me that the top desired capacity building need um, is sustainable financing. And I'm delighted that we can do all this great work with um, great work with sharing experiences and training and technical support, but also financing. It's great that we're able to work on that. And we have worked on it a lot since MPA Connect has existed. Dana showed this actually earlier in the day in the welcome, which I joined for too. Um, we are working hard behind the scenes to access more funding for the network in part to enable you to do follow-up, um, small grant, you know, spot follow-up projects based on what you're learning today and what you'll learn this week um, to work on um, uh, stony coral tissue loss disease. But at the same time, we want to build your capacity to be sufficient and successful, self-sufficient and successful in financing your coral rescue work. So I have 10 lessons about, about financing mechanisms and I have 10 tools or resources that I want to share with you. Uh, this comes from our past work since 2011. We've held two regional learning exchanges that have been fully focused on sustainable financing for Caribbean MPAs. We've funded and we've helped to implement now 16 site-specific projects on sustainable financing. And we've brought some really concerted mentoring effort to coral reef managers in our network, all under the good technical guidance of experts in the topic. So number one on this list, as, as inspiring as it is when you hear somebody has had success with an idea, it's not just a matter of replicating the same mechanisms that have worked for others. Selecting successful and implementing successful financing mechanisms requires an understanding of the unique context for your work. So to tell you a, a quick story, in about 2016, uh, Roatan Marine Park were really keen to replicate Tide Belize's successful Ridge to Reef Expeditions program. That's a financing mechanism that involves paying volunteers helping with monitoring work. 
But Roatan and Marine Park quickly realised that the key elements of the mechanism in Belize just didn't match well with what they had to work with on Roatan in order to be able to host volunteers and make a profit. So they quickly pivoted and looked at what could work. How did they do this? Well, they used the first tool that I'm going to offer to you, which is called the Eco2Fin model. Now, it might look terrible here, but starting at the top, the model guides you through a context analysis to assess the ecosystem services, the benefits, the decision makers associated with your work in order to then identify possible flows of funding. With the help of a SWOT analysis, the next step in this model is then to identify potential obstacles to getting the streams of funding flowing or to consider possible feasible interventions to overcome those obstacles. The Eco2Fin model was helpful in the case of Roatan Marine Park all those years ago. They'd already developed a successful bracelet program um, in return for donations from divers. And after considering how many cruise ship passengers were benefiting from their coral reefs, they did some, some calculations about the potential return from scaling up the bracelet program from divers to cruise ship passengers. And they found that there were easy gains to be made and that they could overcome a couple of easy obstacles and start to generate uh, more funding by expanding that existing financing mechanism. So our second lesson is to consider your existing financing mechanisms and look at how you can strengthen or expand those uh, to now also address coral rescue. Let's think about, though, identifying new financing mechanisms that might be relevant in the context of your work. Well, lesson number three is that it will likely take a number of different financing mechanisms to fund coral rescue, as Alizé mentioned. So here's an overview of different types of financing mechanisms that we work with a lot. This is produced by our friends at Wolf's Company, our experts in financing. Now, if I ask you, how do you think you might fund coral rescue? I bet a lot of you are thinking first of grants, right? Now, grants are, of course, more than welcome, and they're a really important part of the financing picture. But uh, given their competitive nature, the finite timing they work with, the fixed deliverables, they're not a truly sustainable financing mechanism. So what you might focus on instead is developing a strong relationship with your local conservation trust funds. Um, there's actually a lot of funding. Ooh, that's interesting. There's actually a lot of fine funding that's being channeled um, to focus trust funds, uh, to focus on marine conservation financing through local conservation trust funds. Um, and they're actually then dispersing funds to a range of partners and initiatives. So it really will pay dividends to become a close friend and a trusted partner with your local conservation trust fund. Now, there are a lot of different funds existing in the region. And part of my advice is to get your conservation trust fund manager familiar with not just your work that you're doing, but with your budget that you're developing, with your budget needs, and encourage them to do everything to invest in your work for the long term. So in that, I'm talking about a kind of a strategic partnership. And you might actually look for other strategic partnerships, like Alizé mentioned, but it could be with the private sector, with research institutions or relevant government agencies. Part of this is lesson five, that cost effectiveness and cost efficiencies that you can get through partnerships are a really valid and a really important part of your sustainable financing picture. So that's something to really think about. Lesson six is that we've learned that raising sustainable financing requires creative solutions that are tailored to your context. You might also consider things like reef adoption programs, symbolic adoption to raise donations. Um, you might promote those through social media. You could host a sponsored event, a social event for donors. Uh, you could invite paying volunteers to help with your work. You could charge an entry fee to your facilities, or you could sell some cool merchandise. Um, the, there are also innovative mechanisms too that we hope will help with sustainable marine financing in the future. Um, there are things like, um, you know, debt for nature swaps, um, 
insurance, um, bonds, and impact investment. And I'm hoping that Scott Winters from the Coral Restoration Foundation might be in the room with you, and he'll be able to share more in the breakout session about impact investment, um, albeit where investors are looking for returns. The um, um, As Alizé said, there are really creative ways to go into financing, and I'd encourage you to really think creatively outside the box and come up with something new because this list certainly didn't include cocktails and conservation, but it certainly could. Now, to help you explore different financing uh, mechanisms that are known about, I have two suggestions, two resources to suggest to you. The first one is the Biofin Catalog of Financing Solutions. It's a UNDP tool and it has a searchable database with with good information on all sorts of financing mechanisms. Um, you can complement this with another searchable ca catalogue of case studies, the Panorama Solutions Database from Jeff and GIZ. And um, as you can see from Alizé's work, there are great examples um, in our region, and you might find some of them on Panorama, and you can also come to MPA Connect, and we have some other, some other creative solutions that are developing in the region. So are you starting to get some ideas about possible finance mechanisms? Well, we're not done yet because once you identify the mechanisms, the next step is to screen them um, against selection criteria and um, prioritise them for implementation. Now, at MPA Connect, we use these. Um, we use these sort of criteria that I'm showing on the screen here. We're looking for the financial impact of the mechanism. We're looking for the ease of implementation. Uh, we're hoping that there's good likelihood of success. And now the COVID experience has taught us that we also need to look for resilient financing mechanisms. And that's lesson number seven. This means that we're looking for diverse uh, funding mechanisms. We're looking for predictable income and flexibility in using the funding. Now, a fundamental part of deciding which mechanism to implement is the extent to which it will close the, the funding gap that you have. Now, do you know how much it's gonna to cost to implement the coral rescue methods that you're looking at? Good financial management begins with taking the time and the effort to build a budget. We have a budget template that we use with MPA managers, and that might be useful for you as an idea to how to develop your um, coral rescue budget should you need that help. The first step is to arm yourself though with your coral rescue plan. Then you need to identify the activities and the sub activities and those become the rows of your budget. You need to forecast out the annual costs associated with each budget item. And those become um, a bit, you know, those give you your costs, your quantities and the formula to put in, in um, the rows here. Now, for each, we, we identify also um, the categories into which each budget item falls, whether it's personnel, consumables, equipment or infrastructure, contracts or travel. And for each budget item, we indicate the amount of funding secured and the amount remaining to be raised. And you can then look at which activities and which categories have the biggest gaps. From the budget template, we create an overview page that clearly shows the forecast needs and the gaps for fundraising. And this could be quite powerful for you in terms of coral rescue financial planning, taking into account that it's quite a long-term, multi-year programmatic effort. We tend to recommend forecasting budgets like this out three years, maybe five years, depending on your chosen coral rescue approach. Now, depending on the particular mechanism you select, there are other planning tools to know about which can help you to build a roadmap for coral for financing for coral rescue. Lesson number eight is that this work all requires that you do go into some depth. Uh, for example, we've done feasibility analyses and we've done this sort of financial modeling to look at the return on investment, um, especially in the case of enterprise related ideas. We've also then developed business plans and the business plans, we've used the business model canvas. Um, this is a really helpful tool that everyone working on financing ideas loves. It's a way to think through your financing idea. There's a related tool called the value proposition canvas, which can help you with positioning your financing idea 
and determining how to market it in terms of the gains it makes for the beneficiaries and the pains that it can relieve. Um, that's another good tool to, to just be aware of. Now, this, is, this links with your communications. And communications is just an essential part of sustainable financing. That's lesson number nine. We've learned that to develop strategic communications that are going to target the right message at the right audience, there's this tool that we like at MPA Connect called the Message Box Tool. It's a handy single page tool. Um, it helps you look at your problem, uh, or in this case, to look at your financing need for coral rescue and to determine the right messaging to position it to your target audience. Then when it comes to communications, of course, social media is really important. And we've learned that there's an art and there's perhaps a science to communicating and especially for making an effective call for, to action um, for fundraising. Um, yeah, the, making the call to action. Uh, we actually did a, an MPA Connect webinar on this topic. Um, and again, and uh, there, are some, there are some great examples on social media to follow and someone in the room will be able to point you to Instagram where you can follow um, some concerted effort that's being made um, to link social media with fundraising at Roatan Marine Park. Some of you have noticed um, on the program at Reef Futures that there are actually two communication ses sessions that were happening in tandem with, to, with our workshop today. And so I checked in with the facilitators of those sessions about their content because I didn't want you to miss out on that. Now, in the first one of the communications uh, sessions, the Blue Frontiers campaign was going to be talking about, um, was going to be doing training on talking to the media. And essentially, what they were doing in their session was talking about how to change from communicating in a scientific way where you think about explaining the methods, the results, the next research questions to instead telling a story and telling a story with passion. Okay, so that was the essence of the first um, session. Then the second session by the Olapi Creative is applying a method or an approach developed by a fellow called Randy Olson. And it's quite well known. It's called the and, but, and therefore approach to storytelling. They were going to apply that particularly to video. Now, they summarise the approach as being that first you set the scene, then you introduce some conflict, and then thirdly, you provide the resolution. So an example of doing that would be to say, well, there are 350 miles of coral reef off Florida's east coast, and it's an incredible resource, but it's dying. Therefore, Smart people from around the world are gathering to figure out how best to save Florida's and the world's coral reefs this week at Reef Futures. The last lesson that I'm going to tell you is we've learned that coral reef managers really need to be the ones who drive the process of financial planning and communications and who need to be involved in all the aspects of budgeting and financial work um, and communications. It's really not something that we've seen successfully delegated to consultants. Although, of course, some technical assistance and some mentoring can help you with working through these steps. But you know your corals, you know the work that you want to do, and you really know your local context best. There are no shortcuts, but there are tools and there, are tri there is a tried and a tested pathway that I hope I've offered you that you can follow. As you can see with Alizé, we're seeing that our managers are having success in raising sustainable financing for their work, and I know you too can do it. Thanks from the team at MPA Connect. I do want to say thank you uh, for allowing me to be a part of this today because the journey that the Association of Zoos and Aquariums has had through Coral Rescue has been incredible. And we've learned a lot of things and I'm excited to share those with you. So let's get started. Um, as, as Dana said, my name is Beth Furshaw and I'm the coordinator of the network of zoos and aquariums that, in, that with the, the invitation of the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission of Florida, have helped to mount the largest coral rescue operation in US history. 
The network is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums Florida Reef Track Rescue Project. And together with many partners, FWC, as I mentioned, now Fisheries, the National Park Service, and the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, just to name a few, we've saved nearly 2,000 corals from the ravages of stony coral tissue loss disease in Florida. These corals will be part of the broodstock necessary to restore Florida's coral reef in the future. So how does it work? The FRTRP is a network of AZA accredited facilities from across the country caring for Florida coral rescue, Florida rescue corals. Supporting those facilities are a number of working groups composed of holding facility and friends facility representatives that drive the work of the project. Now holding facilities is pretty um, easy to understand, but friends facilities are those facilities, those partners who are not able to hold corals at their facilities, but wanna help the project anyway. Coordinating and supporting all that work is AZA, and it's my lucky opportunity to contribute to this adventure as project coordinator. The project has a fourfold agenda, holding, funding, enhancements, and awareness. Pursuing those goals has resulted in some pretty great products and partnerships. But what we have accomplished and what we hope to do in the future is but one way to pursue saving an underwater ecosystem genetic heritage in the face of environmental trauma. As a part of this workshop, I've been asked to share some thoughts and resources that have led to our success. But remember, there's more than one way to rescue your corals. In preparation for this presentation, though, I reached up to my shelf above my desk and found a resource that I used in developing the project but also continue to refer, refer to as we make our way through our rescue and then into future restoration efforts. That resource is the seven principles of effective conservation partnerships, which was written in January, 2011 by Hannah Clemens Hart and Lee Mars. These seven principles will guide us through today's talk. And I invite you to consider these principles as you think about your own coral reef conservation efforts at home. A PDF of this document is provided in the materials jump drive that you'll receive as part of this workshop. Let me start by saying that nothing has been more important to our success than playing the people game. Placing relationship building at the top of our to-do list has been incredibly rewarding and partnerships is why this document that I'm gonna to refer to today and its principles are so powerful for us in rescue. The document lists seven principles that successful conservation partnerships should have. They're listed here. In, review, in reviewing them, we'll break, break them down each into how we've applied them. The first group, I like to break them down into groups. The first group is actually the first principle alone, mutual interest and shared vision. I like to rename this group, the partnership roadmap. Principles two and five in the second group are what I call the ties that bind. These principles keep the wheels of the partnership on the road. And the last group includes principles six and seven, and I refer to those as fortifying for the future. These principles are the ones that sustain the healthy partnership if all the other principles are in place. Today, we'll explore each of these. I'll provide examples from the Reef Track Rescue Project, and I'd encourage everyone to take stock of your own conservation efforts and see how they align with these principles. So let's talk about these in more detail. As I mentioned, the first principle is mutual interest and shared vision or the partnership roadmap. And we all know roadmaps can be incredibly important. You should always ask yourself, do your partnerships have a shared vision? Can each gain mutual benefit from the partnership? And do they each have a mutual appreciation for all the partners and what they're bringing to the table? Basically, you have to ask, are you better together? For many partnerships, especially private and public partnerships, while your goal may be the same, the mutual interest and share vision to reach that goal may not necessarily be evident at first. So is the case with our CORAL project. Resource managers were faced with a localized extinction event in their own backyard and something had to be done fast. Part of that plan was finding homes for thousands of corals, but who could do that? When the FWC first proposed reaching out to AZA for support, I'm told there were those that thought that, hmm, that's interesting, but I'm really not sure. 
Early on, mutual interest and shared vision may not have been immediately evident to everyone when thinking about federal and state government management of species and the mission of zoos and aquariums, but really it is. Both communities have a vested interest in the health of our environment and our oceans. Both are advocates for strong resource management and public engagement, and both provide opportunities for citizens to experience and to learn appreciation for our natural resources. So in Florida Rescue, you do have a mutual interest and a shared vision. So you strike out on this partnership, and now how do you keep it going? Like a marriage, a conservation partnership takes a lot of work. And these ties that bind principles encourage the active working and cultivation of your conservation partnership. So let's look at these in detail. The second principle, clear communication. In the document, it states clear, consistent communication, both internally and externally, is, is essential to successful partnering. The principle stresses that explicit rules of engagement are needed to create a safe and open arena for discussion and debate. The vision and mission must be in the root of all communications and project goals. Clear leadership and management goals must be defined early in the partnership development. Both the partnership and the individuals must be celebrated and feel rewarded by their activity. And when things go wrong, no finger pointing is allowed, only learning from when it goes wrong. For the way our project developed, AZA became that bridge between two very big partner groups, our holding facilities and our federal and state partners. And we had that covered. Our playbook, our playbook determined how the groups would work together. And it came from our holders document owned by the Fish, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. While the FWC is ultimately the owner of the corals and the main oversight of the project, the daily driving of the program is shared over working groups and task, force, task forces that both react and are proactive to the needs of the project and are composed of members from both partner communities. Ultimate health of the coral is the responsibility of the holding facilities and overseen by FWC. This approach to private and public partnerships in an emergency may be to some quite unique, but that sharing of responsibility was and is vital to getting going quickly and is a hallmark of the overall success of this rescue. Take, for example, our weekly holders calls and our Coral Health Management Advisory Group, or CHIMAG group. The holders group meets every week for an hour. Our CHIMAG meets as a group once a month and attends the holders group at least once a month. In addition to online discussion forums, these calls provide consistent and reliable communication and mentoring time for our coral care community. It's important our holders never feel alone in their efforts to manage rescue corals. And our government partners are part of our discussions and are equally mentors as well as oversight. These calls have set an agenda. These calls, these calls have a set agenda, but there's always time available for ad hoc discussions and anecdotal observations and reports. No topic is silly. And experiences, even those that don't go as planned, are opportunities to learn and share. From these conversations, we can identify ways to enhance the work of our holders build our coral care expertise and knowledge, and make everyone feel a part of a bigger effort and important to that effort. The third principle focuses on trust and diversity. Conservation partnerships grow out of a recognition that the issues at stake often involve multiple interests and the best solutions often involve multiple stakeholders. Wow, that's a mouthful. And so true for coral rescue. For the project, we were, a res we were in rescue mode. Woo! Emergency mode, emergency mode. There was little time, too few people, and too much to do to develop silos and territories. I often, I often describe the project as an onion. Many layers combined together to create one big thing, or a spider web of interconnectivity. That interconnectivity is maintained over time by trust and fortified by diversity. Trust is huge when working with such a large project and many of your stakeholders have never worked together before, need to invest in trust. When it comes to rescue, I'll be honest. At first, it wasn't easy to build trust of our government 
and our nonprofit partners to work together. Consider that many of our AZA facilities knew the FWC as a regulatory body only, as the big hand of government, something to be kept at arm's length. And in turn, many of our FWC colleagues and, not, and government colleagues knew nothing of the professionalism and the depth of which our AZA community is committed to science, research, and conservation. Trust came with time, transparency, and from equity. Partners had to be recognized, curated, and celebrated for the value they bring to the table. We've come a long way. <clears throat> As a case in point is the resource is the resource of the husbandry leadership team. This team composed of AZA coral husbandry experts from across the country with over a hundred years of combined experience in coral care and aquarium systems has been invaluable to the success of the rescue. They are our coral gurus, and in some cases, our coral whisperers. Many of them only knew of the FWC as government managers permitting and regulating the animal acquisitions that make our AZA mission possible. Similarly, many researchers and managers, with, managers within the state and federal government only knew of our gurus as people who care for animals in zoos and aquariums. Some never had the opportunity to experience modern day zoological practices in action, never considered the huge investment zoos and public aquariums make every year to conservation and research, and never really considered the people who worked at zoos and aquariums as skilled, highly professional scientists that they are. Both camps had a lot of dirty learning to do, and both camps had a lot of growing to do. It was not always easy, and there were times when there was opportunity everywhere for the collaboration to run amok. But through it all, the purpose and what we were up against was in sight for everyone. Corals, rescuing corals. Such an unprecedented lift was on everybody's mind. And consider diversity. Remember my onion and my spider web analogies? Regardless of what layer you represent, or what connection you make in the web, you matter. In situations like rescue, when resources are few, people are limited and time too short, you quickly realize that taking stock of what you have and seeking support and resources where you can is essential to your success. But honestly, having such an unusual project is actually quite liberating in that regard. There are no set rules for you to, to, conf to confine your efforts. And you, you can laugh at armchair quarterbacks because you know that if it was easy, it would have been done by others before. You're kind of like a Starship Enterprise, boldly going where no one has gone before, on a mission, and free to bring anybody on board, anyone you meet who has the same interest as you. So too with rescue. And an example of the benefits of this is our commercial friends group. Early on, we realized that providing resources to our holders to access the technical equipment to create and sustain coral holding systems was something we needed desperately. Having worked closely with several of our AZA commercial members and technology and supply partners over the years, we realized that they too might see the value in what we're doing and also see themselves as an important part of rescue, even if they couldn't actually hold corals. Reaching out to this community helped develop the Equipment Resources Initiative a network of partners to provide technical resources to our holders was invaluable to the project. This network also exposed these companies to our government, academic, and international conservation partners, elevating their brand in new communities. The lesson here is, number one, seek out mutually beneficial opportunities with non-traditional or satellite partners that share your interests. Two, be vocal about your desire in partnering with others in unrelated topics. Make it part of your talking points. And three, don't be afraid to make friendships where there were none prior. If a partnership doesn't completely align, define what is aligned and work from there. Consider what hasn't been attempted before and why that may be. Can you overcome that and still make it happen? Partnership, partnerships can bloom everywhere. The next two principles really speak to the ability to make decisions and manage the outcomes of those decisions. It's often said that as leaders, it's not what you do as much as what you do, what you do with it. Or excuse me, <laughs> let's start that again. It's often said as leaders, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. There you go. And this philosophy for the Reef Track project was critical. 
Managing an onion with so many layers can be very difficult if the leadership is not clear on the level of engagement of each partner. The level to which a partner engages directly affects the outcomes of their partnership and should dictate the level to which they are included in decision-making processes. To this end, each partner should be clear on their rules of engagement and their expectations of their role in goal setting. Our rules of engagement have been in part our holders documents, and within those documents is threaded a requirement of communication and a sensitivity to accountability and responsibility of actions by all stakeholders. The Florida Reef Track Rescue Project network of stakeholders and its working groups and products are founded on cooperation, nurtured by collaboration, and result in a unified approach to reaching a fantastic goal. I mentioned before that being something that, that doing something that hasn't been tried before is often fraught with hazards. But we believe it's not how you how hard you hit the ground when you fall, it's how high you bounce afterwards. This is why evaluation and accountability is a principle that binds a partnership together. Allowing for a change in perspective and having the willingness to say this really isn't working is part of reaching is part, is part of us reaching for success. And there must be safe places for stakeholders to acknowledge that and redirect their focus and attention. Time for evaluation should be a regular part of stakeholder working group collaboration time. For evaluation to be effective, setting realistic goals and agreed upon benchmarks is critical. For us, there have been many times on conference calls and phone calls where we've often stopped and asked, why is this so hard? Are we making this more difficult than it needs to be? And what if we look at this another way? And equally important to evaluation is placing responsibility for work and reaching the goal on stakeholders. At the end of every call we have, a to-do list or homework is assigned to everyone. Notes are always taken and members, are, members who are not present know they are to read the notes and learn where we went on the call. Those absent from the conversation know that absence does not remove them from homework. The term being voluntold is a clever euphemism that we use that reminds folks that work goes on with their presence or absence. And because their stakeholders are setting the homework, stakeholders understand, they acknowledge and respect their accountability to getting things done. And building off the previous principles, we come to fortifying the future. These principles build off all that has come before adaptability and creativity, and sustainability of resources. Remember the first principle and the need to have shared mission and vision? Remember the ties that bind? All those previous principles set partnerships up for adapt adaptation and creativity. To be nimble to take quick action and seize opportunities. To look at the present and your path to the future and say, what do we need that we don't have now? And how do we get it? Conservation partnerships must be adaptable and structured in a way that allows for timely decision-making by leaderships, by leadership that's trusted by all the partners. It's not so much about seeking feedback and, and responding as a leader, but more about anticipating opportunities, embracing creativity and direction and process as a team, always with the goal in mind. And you can be, and, and you can be adaptable and, creativity and creative all you want. But if you have no resources, you're really stuck. How many times have you heard, if we only had the funding, if we only had the staff? At the challenge of our Florida Ford leadership that includes the Florida Aquarium, Moat, Disney, and SeaWorld, we approach this project as a small business, a small nonprofit within a nonprofit, because we saw that complex conservation cannot be successfully done through volunteerism alone. And as a nonprofit, we sought resources from all around us, including funding, so those investing in the effort could be sustained. From the start, the financial support of our rescue network came from our stakeholders. In 2021, it was estimated that our network members had contributed over 80% of the estimated over $18 million invested since 2018 in rescue in the rescue effort. Since then, in close collaboration with our partners, the AZA has facilitated the distribution of over 1.4 million to our members from the Florida state and federal grants, and additional opportunities are being developed for the coming years. 
Similarly, very early on, we sought to create opportunities that brought resources to the project and fortified our holders. We mentioned our equipment resource initiative previously. As an example, through that interaction with our project, one of our partners, Aqualogic, has worked with us to create a new adaptable coral raceway system that can not only support our holders' needs here in the U.S., but other rescue efforts now are exploring its use in their projects in other countries. This technology is available to all and was created within the collaboration of Florida Rescue. And in the coming year, we'll be kicking off our Coral Aquarist training program. You see from the start, we knew that our human resource was going to be our most limiting resource. And we found out that platform after platform, it really has been sometimes outpacing funding and the need for space. And we decided 18 months ago to make sure that we were mitigating the risk of not having our, our deep bench available to take care of building scale of our coral needs. The Florida Reef Track Rescue Project Coral Aquarist Training will provide the knowledge and experiential introductory foundations necessary to manage Florida rescue coral broodstock in land-based nurseries. The course is only a few months from becoming a reality and it will be our way of building our bench. The course is composed of two phases listed here. More on this initiative will be provided later in my talk on Wednesday. We all know that partnerships are critical to addressing the conservation issues of today. Today, we've explored some benchmarks that can be used to plan a new collaboration or evaluate an, ex an existing one. What I've shared today is based on our experiences in Florida and the US. While each rescue and restoration effort is different, the principles I've shared today can be applied everywhere. The document used as a foundation for our presentation is available on the jump drive, as I said, and I encourage you to download it and keep it happy or keep it handy. <laughs> Referring to it no matter where you are in your project development or saving your backyard reef. I want to thank the organizers of this workshop and the Reef Futures organizers for inviting me to be a part of today's conversation. And I'll leave you with this. Collaboration and partnerships aren't always easy. But corals have known for millions of years that working together, you can make a huge impact. Thank you very much. The, in, in the first one, uh, she said that uh, it's the work that in, in Mexico it, we want to be together to face the challenge of the stony coral tissues, lose disease. So, and I love the, the uh, slides that she made for this collaboration, collaboration, collaborations. Uh, since the first size of the stony coral tissue disease in Mexico, a strong collaborating approach has been used. We are several groups with limited resource, but with different geographic areas and capacities that can be joined together in order to achieve more impact academia, NGOs, government, and community groups were involved in the first monitoring and treatment trials. Funds from different participant groups were put to the task, taking from other projects or adding uh, stony quality tissue disease into the objectives, but not the most uh, uh, viable options, but effective, nonetheless, to react quickly and be able to go on on the field and exchange with one another. And another. Uh, we have organized meetings, works, workshops, and also used a lot of social media and progress coverage. Relaying between all the organizations, we were able to increase our reach quickly. The action plan that we talked before. One of the main products of those early collaboration was been the Mexican Action Plan. It includes representatives from 10 marine protected areas and more than 47 organizations that all came together to build that document during several workshops that were facilitated by a dedicated team that made sure that all it, it was aligned 
with the different organization work plans. So resources and capacities were available or findable, uh, was action oriented and has leaders for following up in order to make it uh, more viable for it to be implemented. A very important point is that at the beginning of the project, a dedicated coordinator was pointed to the action plan and that helped a lot of meetings, several of targets. When no one is in church or following or touching base with one another, it became really difficult to main engagement and track the progress. Now, uh, part of this plan, action plan includes a gene bank where in APESCA, where, is, uh, where I work, was the leading organization to see this objective. Uh, and this was greatly inspired by the program in the US, but needed to be adapted to our local realities as we don't know, uh, as we don't know have the same budget or infrastructure. And join forces. They said on experience available in our state, uh, and Melina said, which is quite a lot actually, <laughs> we designed a project that will involve uh, three main objectives, rescue fragments of colonies of most susceptible species that we were losing as dendrogyra, dendrogyra cylinders, produce new colonies through sexual reproduction and cryopreserved gametes from future restoration. We fortunately got funded by Marfon for two successive grants of around 20K US each one. And that's how private sector, government, N NGO, and academia got on board the same project, the, the same project. The team at Inapesca and Eshcaret were mainly involved in the fragments and colonies rescue in their facilities, while UNAM Coral Coralium Lab will be focused on sexual reproduction and cryopreservation of gametes. And all these align with each of the participate uh, know-how and individual objectives. Healthy Reefs Initiative play a, coordinate, a coordinating role, a good one, very, very good one, <laughs> taking advantage on their many years of building collaboration and networks through the MIR, producing external communication material in order to reach a wide audience and receive reports of sightings and widespread of the, the world done by the planet. Using the external network and social network, but also following up on progress, impact indicators, etc., and being the link between the partners and with the funding organization, producing the technical and financial report, uh, which um, alleviate weight on the field and lab stems. Amigos de Isla Contoy provide their administrative platforms. And this is one of the other very beautiful uh, infographies. And this is how they managed to uh, safeguard 58 colonies from the most affected species in the facilities at, at Inapesca and the Aquarium of Escaré. And um, they are go through a strict quarantine process and then in the integrate either special isolation tank, uh, tanks with uh, more controlled condition if the health requires it, 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 or in the mesocosm, the big one that I uh, so, uh, showed you before, where they are held in more diverse conditions with sun, herbivorous um, crabs. Some of the fragments have been reintroduced, and in water nursery, where stony coral tissue disease has not been observed. At the UNAM, 
the Coralium Laboratory, thanks to the team of Dr. Ania Abanasak and support from Seacor International, the gametes of five of the most affected species have been collected and cryopreserved for future investigation and sexual reproduction restoration programs, including some sperm of um, Dendrogera cylindrus collected from a happy rescue colony in Inapesca, the video that I showed you before. These more than uh, 400 vials are kept at, um, at ah, uh, I, I think it's the temperature, I don't know this number, and can wait very long period of time to be used. That is the preservation preserv results. Now, um, this one is the other than uh, I showed you before. And with the participation of everybody, we success in implementing an innovative collaborating project that, thanks to its several lines of action, has been able to cover several flanks in facing the challenge of stony coral tissue disease in coral restoration. It has to be known that each partner dedicates a good amount of his own resource time, salaries, and maintain expenses, for example, that they repair more funds than uh, the ones granted by the project and came from, from other uh, projects, donors, etc. And again, uh, again, creativity, sharing capacities, and strong commitment has gone along the way. The last one, lesson learned. Uh, this may seem easy now, but it sure has been a learning curve. Facing such difficult challenge represented by stony coral tissue disease in our line of work is most of the time overwhelming and teaming up may, might be the only solution. But it has its own um, challenge as government, private se sector, academia, and NGOs most of the time have different approaches, different administrative requirements, and are not used to speak to each other that much. Uh, keeping open and transparent between all members, the channel of communication is of utmost importance. Meeting regularly and creating exchange space to present and share the team's update strength, strengthens the uh, uh, engagement. Unforeseen events will happen, like hurricane or pandemic, so uh, have a simple plan, plan with realistic objectives that will enable you to adapt quickly. Using each partner's strength without adding more weight or one on one or another or new on dominate process will have a great impact. Collaboration can, can be tricky. tricky. Uh, so if one of the partners can be in charge of the coordination, reporting and administration, it will easy process. And that was the job from, job from Melina Soto that she does great. And don't forget to celebrate even the smallest success and have fun whenever you can. And the last beautiful slide. <laughs> Thank you so much.